seminar number 238 and today we're in Japan and um, we're looking at the internationalization of curriculum in English medium instruction programs at Japanese universities and I'll introduce our two speakers on that topic in a moment let me take you through the webinar protocols now the, the webinar is being recorded um, as it always is so it'll be posted online on the CG website fairly soon uh, usually within a day or two, and a transcript of the chat function will be available on our website, as of course you'll be able to link to the YouTube video through there as well. Now, please keep yourself muted during the webinar, uh, unless you've been asked to speak or you, you know, you're about to come in to ask a question. We recommend using speaker view in Zoom so you can more clearly see who is talking at any given moment. Now, to ask a question, we very much encourage you to come into the discussion after the speak, main speakers are finished. To ask a question, use the chat function. Write out your question there and or your statement if you want to make a statement rather than a question. And we'll select people into the uh, Q&A part of the webinar from the, on the basis of what's appearing in the chat. Um, good idea to come forward early. I say this every time, but but what tends to happen almost every time is that we get a rush of people coming into the webinar wanting to in the last 10 minutes and we can't accommodate everyone. And we have this strange lag at the beginning of the Q&A between the speakers and the, and the people rushing in where, where we're sort of hard pressed to get people going. So help us all, help the speakers especially by responding quickly to them, coming forward with your comments and questions, you know, even during the, when they're speaking. So we'll be able to bring you in quickly into the Q&A part of the webinar. Now, when you're invited to ask a question, I'll give you a warning in the chat and, uh, and then, uh, then call you in. Um, you uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Um, uh, you also switch on your video and ideally, people never remember this, but you should state your name and where you are from. So don't forget to post your questions early. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Christopher D. Hammond, um, we call him Chris, and I think you can probably do that in the webinar. Um, much valued colleague um, and recent graduate from Oxford, but I was delighted to be able to work with Chris for several years on his DPhil project. Um, he's now a project associate professor in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Tokyo, Japan. So perhaps on another occasion, we could ask Chris how he managed to land such a spectacular job in, this, in, in the greatest university in Japan, um, University of Tokyo, the great imperial university, which became the leading national university after World War II. And those of you, those of you who've been to University of Tokyo will know what I'm talking about. It's a most interesting and impressive um, place. Uh, Chris has got his default from Oxford. He previously did a master's in comparative education at UCL. And he's also done a master's in teaching from the University of Washington in the United States. Published a number of papers and book chapters on comparative and international higher education and over 14 years field experience, uh, primarily in Japanese universities. And he's joined today by Leila Rajai. Leila is a PhD candidate at the Graduate School of Asia Pacific Studies in the dynamic Waseda University in Japan. She's also a program advisor at the Secretariat of the International Peace Cooperation Headquarters in the Cabinet Office. Her research includes um, internationalization and regionalization of higher education issues, internationalization of curriculum and education for peace building. And we'll find out more about both of our speakers as we go. And I'm really pleased to hand over at this point to Chris Hammond. Okay, thank you very much, Simon, for that introduction. And good evening, uh, everyone from Tokyo. Let me just share my screen with you here. Um, so thank you again, Simon, very much for that introduction and for inviting Layla and I to speak with you today. Uh, the title of our presentation, Internationalization of Curriculum in English Medium Instruction Programs at Japanese Universities. Um, Evolutions in Pedagogy in the Era of the New Normal. And by new normal, Perhaps you can uh, guess that we are referring 
to the era of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, some of our slides today are a little bit text dense. I know this is being recorded, so I thought it might be interesting to uh, make sure there was lots of information that uh, people could later go back and pause and look at our slides. Um, and we might go a little bit quickly over some of them, but if you have any questions, please feel free to ask and we can go back and discuss certain slides in more detail. Finally, um, we're in the early stages of this project and are far from experts. So uh, we're very much, uh, we very much welcome your comments and your ideas and questions to help us take this project forward. So an overview of the broad study. This is a five year funded project from the uh, Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Um, and we intend to do repeated qualitative interviews and quantitative surveys. The initial aim when we devised this project was to try to uncover factors that enable and block the internationalization of curriculum, which we uh, refer to as IOC for brevity's sake, in the context of the pandemic in Japanese higher education. And as in many places around the world, this setting is now characterized by increases in online learning and other innovative approaches to higher education provision. The long-term goal will be to see how educators and students respond and adapt to changes in IOC and provision over the next five years. Uh, today, we'll be talking to you about two small-scale projects uh, here at the early stage of our broad study. The first we're referring to as phase one was a pilot study that uh, included document analysis and qualitative interviews with educators in different EMI, English Medium Instruction programs. The findings from this uh, pilot study led us to devise phase two, which we've just been doing for a few months now. And this has been uh, interviews with educators involved in a type of virtual student mobility uh, called here in Japan, COIL, or Collaborative Online International Learning. Um, so just at the beginning here, I'm going to go over some key terms and concepts. These are the key terms and concepts here. And I'll speak briefly about each of these because defining these concepts was important for us to understand the parameters of our study. Um, in order to understand how curriculum can be internationalized, we recognize the importance of understanding the varied meanings of the term curriculum. And here you can see there's a range of ideas, including uh, the formal and planned curriculum as intended by policymakers and educators. There's also the important ideas of symbolic, social, and hidden curricula. And ultimately, it's the curriculum that is received by learners that's arguably uh, that matters most. Uh, although this term suggests a passive rather than active constructivist approach to learning. And uh, Kelly uh, rightly suggests that curriculum is the totality of student experiences. Um, but within all of these broad definitions or varied definitions, we're interested in particular in the dimension of curriculum that focuses on the role of educators and their perspectives um, as they um, implement curriculum in classrooms. So uh, what isn't curriculum? It is quite an, an expansive term. English medium instruction is a little bit more straightforward. Here we have a definition from Makaro, the use of English to teach academic subjects other than English language itself in countries or jurisdictions where the first language of the majority of the population is not English. So in our context, Japan fits this definition. So what is I? IOC, what is the internationalization of curriculum? Betty Leesk is a major scholar in this particular area, and her definition is uh, here, the incorporation of international, intercultural, or global dimensions into content, as well as learning outcomes, assessment tasks, teaching methods, and support services of a program of study. So this too is a quite expansive uh, umbrella definition that is open to different interpretations and manifestations. And we were curious to see how this definition might uh, manifest in the Japanese context. 
But interestingly, and um, connecting our uh, topic to some of the very interesting talks that came in previous weeks, we were curious about these ideas of IOC and EMI um, and how it raises some interesting questions in non-Anglosphere context. Namely, is IOC a form of decolonization of curriculum and pedagogy, as discussed in the very good talk that was given last Thursday? Or could it possibly be a, an imposition of a Western ideal in non-Western contexts, um, a form of colonialism in and of itself? So as we'll suggest later, there's different types or ideas about what internationalization broadly might be, as well as IOC, and some could fit either of these definitions. This slide is a referencing a, a different paper about the incorporation of international faculty in Japan, but some of these concepts seem to apply well to uh, IOC as well. Finally, uh, virtual student mobility and COIL. These are pretty similar. Um, VSM, as defined by UNESCO, is a form of mobility that uses uh, ICT, communication technologies, online tools to uh, deliver academic, cultural, and experiential exchanges and collaborations. COIL is a type of VSM, although a notable point is that it has a very strong intercultural component. There's an emphasis on cross-cultural uh, interactions and understanding. Um, okay. Popping up in the chat. Okay, and it uh, looks like it's now time to pass over to Layla. Layla, you ready? Yes, thank you, Chris. Um, here I will talk about the Japanese context. Um, when we talk about the Japanese higher education um, strategy, we can see three main elements. Inviting international students was one of its first official initiatives, uh, which started in 1980s. But from 2000s, uh, the government gradually started also focusing on the domestic students on uh, global competencies development as well. Um, and many program and infrastructure reforms were done to accomplish those goals and establishment of EMI courses was uh, one of them and also COIL as well. And then as a result, uh, as you can see the number of international students in Japan um, increased. And uh, also the number of Japanese students studying abroad um, increased. Uh, however, as you can see, uh, most of these uh, domestic students uh, who study abroad, they study abroad for less than a month. And uh, now with the COVID pandemic, the mobility reduced um, dramatically. So uh, why do we focus on EMI? Um, in Japan, EMI is seen as a tool to achieve the goals of nurturing global competencies of Japanese students uh, or creating global human resources as the government says, um, and also bringing talented international students. Um, not many students can afford to study abroad and, also, um, and that's why for many domestic students, EMI classes are the only international classes can take, um, as in where do both domestic and international students uh, study together. Um, now many universities in Japan offer EMI co courses, um, 305 universities for undergraduate level and 227 universities uh, for the graduate level courses. Um, however, um, not all EMI classes in Japan are accom accommodating both international and domestic students. There are different models of EMI courses in Japan, depending on what they focus on. For example, global human resources uh, model, um, they target domestic students um, for their international skills development. And the JIMA model, uh, it focuses on international students and these models seem to be isolated within, within the universities 
and, and there should be little interaction uh, of domestic and international students. On the other hand, there is crossroad model that targets both domestic and international students. So um, many policymakers or educators often think that having diverse students on campus or in a classroom automatically leads to development of their intercultural competences. Um, it's probably the same logic that the government has for EMI, that students attending EMI classes with international students automatically leads to their intercultural awareness. But many scholars say that that's not the case and it doesn't happen automatically. And that is where internationalization of curriculum becomes important uh, to use that international classroom environment. Um, lecturing in English uh, language doesn't mean that the course is international, but in Japan, uh, EMI courses are often regarded as international courses for the development of intercultural awareness or competences of the students. That is why we thought we need to investigate IOC in EMI classes at Japanese universities. Scholar Betty Lisk um, talks about the factors that support IOC and factors that could be an obstacle as enablers and blockers. And she presents three main factors. Uh, cultural one comes from the values, uh, beliefs, and dominant way of thinking in a discipline or a subject. Um, they become blockers when the presumptions and beliefs about the discipline could be an obstacle for change. This includes skepticism and denial about the relevance of IOC for a specific discipline or subject. And institutional ones um, are those related to the characteristics, policies, and practices of universities. And personal ones are related to the mindset and skill set of the educators. Um, personal blockers include a possible lack of capacity, willingness, commitment, or confidence of the faculty members to engage in IOC. Um, now, Chris will talk about our phase one research questions and findings. Okay, thank you, Leila. So our research questions for the first project are here. What are the factors that faculty members perceive to enable or block IOC in EMI programs? And secondly, how have the IOC dynamics changed because of the pandemic? What might the new challenges and possibilities be? Our methodology was qualitative and uh, we analyzed documents uh, both at the government and university levels. Um, and we interviewed 11 faculty members from three national and five private universities involved in the EMI programs to try to identify the current situation, the ideas they had about IOC and uh, the challenges that they faced. Um, we made a concerted effort to try to not just focus on the English language in our research, and we did document analysis and interviews in both English and Japanese. Uh, my Japanese is very much a work in progress, but Leila is a native speaker, so it was a, a great asset to be able to uh, to do uh, to to bring the two different languages into our methodology. Um, here's some information about our participants. We um, made sure they felt comfortable by uh, assuring them that we would keep a lot of their um, information that might identify them private. And so we don't have too many details here about their particular uh, disciplines or their institutions, but you can see on the far right, the type of EMI model um, that they were uh, teaching in, the type of university and the broad uh, discipline uh, or disciplinary family in which they were teaching. Um, some limitations to our study are one, we didn't, uh, interview anyone that was involved in a Dejima model that only focused on international students. There's a obvious underrepresentation of STEM disciplines, and this is a pretty uh, important limitation 
it really skews our findings towards um, humanities and social sciences uh, disciplines. And we didn't quite uh, get a uh, interview from an educator at a public, a local public university who uh, institutions that are often driven by slightly different strategies and goals. Okay, some findings. Um, here we can see on the left, uh, some of the levels identified by LISC, uh, the cultural level first, um, the values, beliefs, and dominant ways of thinking in a discipline. Some of the blockers we identified um, in the hard sciences. Uh, and again, we didn't speak to too many um, hard scientists, but they did have quite a bit to say about this topic. Science is universal. IOC in the minds of many uh, hard scientists um, is not really relevant. The, the foundational ideas of the various bounded disciplines is what needs to be delivered to students. Um, some others that were in international quote unquote studies or disciplines sort of had the assumption that their, their content and curriculum was already internationalized simply because um, international topics were being covered. Um, others that were a bit more tuned in to IOC talked about how that their subjects were conducive to adapting and internationalizing. And some of these topics look, were um, included uh, inter environmental issues, global studies, and so on. At the institutional level, the level of the universities, um, blockers included the fact that there is a long standing tradition in Japan of uh, faculty autonomy and certain form we suggest of academic freedom in that the institutions often don't have very much power to tell the faculties and the individual educators what they can and should do. Um, therefore, it was a bit difficult uh, for IOC policies to be imposed from the top down. Other blockers um, for internationalization more broadly was competition between departments uh, conservative culture of re uh, resistant to change, the um, marginalization of contract-based faculty, which is a, a growing number uh, of the uh, faculty and administrative staff at universities in Japan, many of whom seem to be uh, willing and eager to try new things, but uh, were relatively powerless to make uh, changes to policy. Um, the same blocker of institutions not being able to impose from above uh, an IOC curriculum or an IOC policy meant that if individual educators wanted to, they did have the freedom in their classrooms to try new approaches, including uh, implementing IOC. This really led us to uh, um, suggest from our findings that it was the personal level that really was the most salient uh, to uh, IOC in Japan at this particular moment. Um, it depended uh, in our, based on our, our few interviews that we did on the faculty members own research area, whether they'd had experience abroad themselves, an understanding of IOC, and in the context of the pandemic, uh, knowledge uh, of I ICT and practices like COIL. Um, the government level also proved to be very important, uh, more so than what was originally um, identified in the three levels proposed by LISC. Um, I think I mentioned this more so on the second slide or the next slide as well. So I'll just move on to that one. So some other findings related to this. Um, LISC framework posits that IOC must be grounded in the academic disciplines. Um, but many of the uh, global human resources and crossroads model EMI programs in Japan lacked a disciplinary foundation. Um, they often offered lots of different subjects in the humanities and social sciences. And so we suggest that there needs to be some other foundation or pedagogical approach upon which to develop an internationalized curriculum. The other point was again, that the government strategies and policies really seem to be central in Japan in terms of internationalization. They control the funding, they often have uh, the power to approve curriculum or programs of study. So making formal changes 
two programs take uh, take quite a bit of uh, uh, process and take time. I think there was four year cycles before new uh, programs can be approved. And so we suggest that the government level really should be another um, distinct uh, level for uh, analyzing blockers and enablers. Um, research question two, how have uh, IOC dynamics changed because of the pandemic? What are the new possibilities? The force shift to online and hybrid modes of teaching provided an exogenous shock to Japanese universities, highlighting these uh, points. There was considerable technological deficiencies in both infrastructure and teaching capacity. Um, the value of considering new approaches to teaching and learning like flipped classrooms and pre-recorded lectures. Um, this, so the pandemic in some sense uh, opened the mind of, of educators to try new things because they, they had to, but once they did, they realized there were some benefits to different ways of doing things. Of course, there's lots of challenges inherent in uh, doing online teaching and learning. And um, this is possibly exacerbated when the goal is successful intercultural exchange. Um, just looking directly at someone else's face without uh, nonverbal body language cues and so forth really can create, I think, uh, additional communication challenges that might be um, not as uh, significant in a classroom setting. And importantly, one of our main findings was that there were possibilities for IOC through COIL. Uh, through collaborative online international learning or virtual student mobility, which leads us to our second uh, phase of the project. And Layla is going to speak about, oh no, am I on this one, Layla? I think I am. Um, the first phase was the one we just talked about. The government, as I briefly alluded to, has tended to focus on uh, quantitative metrics for measuring success for internationalization but they have funded one particular project for virtual student mobility, uh, a COIL project with partners in uh, US, the US, universities in the US. And Layla is gonna speak a bit about that, okay? Yes, thank you, Chris. So the objectives um, of our study for the second phase is to understand whether the government driven a project could promote IOC among educators in Japanese universities. So we wanted to understand how far existing core classes are collaborated with uh, partner institutions and to uncover the challenges of COIL and also to analyze the outcomes of the COIL project. But this is just like the first stage of our research and we are still in progress. So Japanese Government uh, funding project to promote COIL started in 2018, which lasts for five years. Um, under this project, 10 projects uh, from 13 universities uh, got funded, and they aim to establish partnerships with 64 U.S. universities and 12 other uh, universities around the world. And these are the titles of the funded projects. Um, you can see a variety of topics for uh, core projects. So um, one of the characteristics of COIL is that COIL focuses on the collaborations of the professors and also students. And depending on the type and level of collaborations, uh, there are different modes. You can make either your existing course a COIL class, or you can develop a new course. Uh, and then for the students, it could be synchronous or asynchronous. Um, they can do real-time discussions uh, using Zoom or use SNS or other platforms for their communications. Uh, we wanted to find out how far educators and students actually collaborate. And so far, we only had four interviewees, but it seems like the typical collaboration is the type that you collaborate for one or two classes out of 15 classes of existing course. And if the time zone allows, they fear to do the real-time discussion. 
But since this uh, coal project was with US partnership, uh, the time zone was one of the challenges. So the interviewees mentioned several challenges. Um, one is finding partner educator. Uh, they mentioned that they need to find a partner who is flexible enough to collaborate. And they also mentioned that they usually prefer to use their personal connections. And another challenge is the subject, because you need to learn about partner syllabus and course to find common ground for collaboration. And also the language ability. Uh, language is often a challenge for those who cannot communicate in English easily, since English tends to be the language of the communication and instruction. And these educators who are involved and in charge of COIL, um, they don't get credits or pay extra for these additional work of COIL, but they are educators um, who find it interesting and valuable and willing to get involved. So willingness was one of the important aspects of the involvement. So this is still a hypothesis, but we believe that there might be expected and unexpected outcomes of core projects. Um, government and universities initially saw COIL as just a preparation for students to study abroad. Uh, it was one of the tools to raise the number of MOUs and to increase the student mobility. But now with the COVID pandemic, uh, COIL has become important as uh, one of the few international activities that university can actually continue. And also for the faculty members, um, they mentioned that they are involved because they want to enhance students' intercultural awareness and skills. But we think that COIL actually could be a learning opportunity for the educators as well. Uh, it could raise um, educators' IOC awareness. And also the relationship with the partner university uh, and the faculty members, that may lead to future academic collaborations. Uh, this needs more investigation, and we need more time and interviews, but we try to, to find out. So now we go back to the main question we had for the phase two or our research project. Can COIL promote IOC among the educators? So by interviewing a number of faculty members, we realized that there are two different understandings or interpretation of internationalization. Uh, one is centralized internationalization. This type of internationalization directed towards the dominant ideas, knowledge, or standards. For example, aiming for higher rank in international high, higher education rankings, which Japanese government often mentioned this as one of its goals, or having partnership with only a certain type of universities, which happened for the COIL project initiated by the government focusing on U.S. university partnership and also limiting the language of instruction to English or presuming that discipline is already international is uh, also moves towards the inter centralized internationalization. On the other hand, what we call pluralistic internationalization is what we value. Um, it is the type of internationalization that accepts all kinds of ideas and knowledge and we can move towards pluralistic internationalization uh, when we are aware of our own knowledge bias. Uh, and some of the examples to achieve this would be ha having partnership with different types of universities from around the world, um, not limiting the language of instruction to English. And, and this idea of pluralistic internationalization on also connects to the idea of decolonization. Um, so having said these, uh, we think that COIL has a potential to bring pluralistic internationalization uh, by collaboration among the educators and students around the world. However, the way that the Japanese government initiated COIL at this stage, uh, focusing on one country, the US, 
uh, it also looks like we are moving towards centralized internationalization. So we think that IOC awareness of the educators are very important uh, in this sense that they are the one who can actually shift it to, uh, to the pluralistic internationalization. So uh, moving forward, uh, we will be conducting more interviews with the faculty members involved in COIL projects. Also, we plan to research and analyze the outcomes of IOC from the students' perspectives. We would like to interview or uh, conduct survey uh, but to the students. And we will also like to explore the IOC in STEM area in the future. These are the main sources. Thank you very much. And we appreciate your comments and questions. Thank you. And thank you, Lila, and thank you, Chris. Uh, and in the manner of these things, we had no questions, and then we've got a lot. So this is very good, and uh, we now have a, a chance to um, to, cir to circle through a number of issues in the Q and A. Let me begin the process by asking a question, which really relates to the pandemic. It's really got, you know, two parts to it. One is that what's happening in Japan. I mean, most of us, I think realize now that the COVID-19 is not going to be something you can stop altogether. You know, you can't prevent a society from having any exposure to it uh, and that we need to live with it. And we need to live with it, hopefully with 100% vaccination or near as, as we can to it. Um, as Japan reached the stage of acknowledging that it's going to live with it and that, and therefore opening up as far as it can, uh, or are we still in the stage of prevention and, you know, and, and, and shut down uh, of many activities. The other question I've got about COVID-19 is more directly related to the presentation. And that's in relation to what Chris said about um, online learning. Um, I had the experience of giving a mixed um, seminar online about halfway through last year. And it was apparent then um, the ministry was very concerned that at, the low, at the low level of technological take up in administration in Japan communications and administration compared to most OECD countries. And there was a concerted effort going on to try to retool and strengthen uh, electronic systems, uh, digital systems in Japanese universities. Um, has the uh, pandemic period accelerated the development of the take up of technologies, digital technologies in administration and teaching? I mean, has, has it had that effect? So that, I know those questions were a bit off your presentation, but. I think that we need to know about the pandemic a bit and how it's affecting things. Um, and then we'll go into this very interesting set of questions we have. The first one will be from Jeff Scruton, but I, perhaps if you could answer my question first. Sure. Uh, Leila, do you want to speak about uh, Waseda? What wa Waseda's response to the pandemic? I can speak uh, about a few of the different universities that I have direct experience with, if you'd like. All right, you just break a little bit and I couldn't catch the question. Okay, let me let me go ahead and, and respond to, to Simon. Um, it sounds like there is a little bit of a, a connection difficulty. Um, my understanding, and I, I'm not an expert on this, but based on my own experiences in uh, teaching at a few different universities in Japan, is that uh, the, the shift was abrupt uh, last year to online teaching and learning. Um, and many uh, parents, uh, apparently the administrators were getting phone calls from parents demanding that their children have uh, the chance to teach, to, to experience uh, education in the classrooms. And they were also getting calls from concerned parents saying, don't you dare uh, have my, my child um, be in a classroom. You need to do everything online. So I think, decisions were being made in a, in a panic mode, in a sense. Um, I've been teaching online for the past uh, year and a half, and um, most of the institutions where I've worked have had options uh, to do so, whereas one has had a policy where um, they really seem to be pushing for classroom face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching and learning. And I had my first taste of that last week where I was sort of in this sort of 
plastic box. I was I had to do hybrid or high flex. There was all of these gizmos and and fans blowing air out of the rooms. Buzzers went off in the middle of class to remind us to open windows. So it seems like different universities are taking a different different approaches. Um, and perhaps Layla, you can speak about uh, Wasida's case if you want. But let me just quickly go to the topic of administration. Um, and I do know one in interesting thing about uh, Wasida and the president, uh, I believe it's Tanaka, um, really made a push, a quite controversial push to move all documents into online or PDF form a few years ago. Uh, Japan still has a very um, long standing tradition of the, uh, the income, the little stamp that you have to put on yeah. all of these different documents. And um, just yesterday uh, in my new uh, job, submitting a lot of different papers, paperwork, still have to bring the little stamp physically to the university to uh, stamp the documents. And uh, it's a long cultural tradition. There's resistance to change and getting rid of that. I think it was uh, one of the um, ministers who ran for prime minister, uh, Kono, who has been trying to get rid of the Incon in uh, Japanese bureaucracy. But um, that's one example of sort of the physicality uh, that's really bound up with a lot of administrative practices, face-to-face -face meetings, um, and uh, employees sort of sat in desks with the uh, manager observing to making sure everyone's uh, working. The pandemic has really shaken things up and has shown that um, it's possible to do work from home. It's not necessary to ride a packed train every day. And it seems like it's been good in some ways for sort of uh, shocking the system into rethinking uh, the possibilities for administration as well as teaching. Leila, anything to add? Um, nothing much, but from what I understand, it's about how universities change uh, because of the COVID, pandem COVID pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. In Waseda's case, um, well, I think it was one of the uh, one of the first universities to call um, all. Uh, students are brought to come back home and also shift to online classes uh, and uh, libraries and all campuses was closed but then gradually now it's shifting to hybrid and uh, I guess uh, even even when it's hybrid uh, not many students actually attend the classes I think from my understandings um, because well, online classes also has its own uh, benefits and merits. Uh, but yeah, so I think that's the case about uh, Waseda. Let me quickly then take go to our call list. And um, I think what we'll do, given that we've got 10 people, two of whom have asked two questions in the call list, is that we'll take them in batches so that I'm going to ask our speakers to remember the questions will there be multiple. I'll, we'll do twos at first and we might move to threes. So be prepared for that uh, and try to keep your responses fairly brief. I'm sorry to have to say that, but you can see the obvious need to do that. So, and can I ask our questioners also to be succinct in their phrasing because we have so many. So the first batch will be Jeff Scruton and Zainab Jaffa. So Jeff, can you come in please? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Jess Schotter from uh, KU Leuven University in Belgium. Um, I have two questions. Um, I will keep my questions quite short. Uh, both IOC and COIL are quite new. Um, and professors and others are trained in a certain way and in a certain reality. Um, and they're quite experts within those boundaries. Um, when they are asked to engage in IOC or COIL, they might have less tools to assess the quality of the developments in other areas. Um, have you met, have you received any answers going in that direction? Well, I want to do it, but how can I be sure what is uh, of good quality um, elsewhere? Then my second question is about um, relative internationalization. Um, is that really, oh no, sorry, a centralized internationalization where you well, we all tend to speak English and stuff. Um, do you consider that a real version of internationalization or is that a new artificial reality? 
um, that comes on top of national or local realities um, where you create a new reality and you don't really get to know other cultures as you would do in uh, relative internationalization. Uh, thank you, that were my questions. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hold that. Hold your thoughts, speakers, and we'll take also the question from Zainab Jaffa. Zainab, please. Uh, yes, thank you. I am Zainab Jaffa from the University of Basra uh, from Iraq. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. I would like to ask about the use of ESP. Uh, how does your work differ from ESP English for specific uh, purposes? And a very short question is about the native uh, language. I got that your work promotes English to be the leading language of education. So what about the status of native language um, as far as the uh, education in universities so far? Thank you. Over to you, Chris and Layla. Uh, maybe I'll go first. Mm -hmm. uh, so about the questions, um, and about the professors and educators' response about COIL and IOC. Yes, as you mentioned, uh, well, the, even, even um, the definition of IOC or the idea of IOC or COIL was um, not so familiar in, among Japanese educators. So when we, uh, when we ask about uh, IOC, uh, they some some of the faculty members they didn't even know what it means. They they thought it's it's just having the lectures in English, and when we explain, uh, they don't know how actually to internationalize the curriculum. But sometimes there are these um, institute um, institutional ports and centers that they can provide services. And also um, there are faculty members, um, informal faculty members communities that they support each other. Uh, that, that is one of the institutional factors that could lead to IOC in Japanese higher education. Um, and then about the question about, um, of Zainab, uh, use of uh, native language. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, but most of the uh, language of instruction in Japanese higher education is Japanese. Uh, EMI classes are uh, rare, uh, relatively rare classes that they conduct um, in English and not so many qualified um, faculty members are available to actually conduct uh, EMI classes. Uh, maybe Chris has something to add. Uh, just the question about ESP, English for specific purposes, and how it might connect or differ from EMI. Um, the government has been pushing for EMI and from the documents that we uh, analyzed. English as a medium of instruction. There's no language teaching component. In reality, a lot of the educators we spoke to said, yes, EMI is the dream. But what we really need to do is CLIL or content language integrated learning, which is a bit of EMI, a bit of language instruction. And depending on the level of the students, you, you dial up one and dial down the other. ESP is another uh, approach to English uh, language education. And it wasn't really part of what we were looking at. But again, the reality in classrooms often is a bit more geared towards uh, English language teaching along with the uh, dream of teaching uh, content to a deep level. And just to go quickly back to the uh, question about quality, I thought that was very interesting. And I think a few educators who we spoke to that were unsure about how to implement IOC, they may have known about it or had a, an in, a inkling about what it might be, but they didn't know what it actually would look like in practice. And I think that's a real challenge to change pedagogy and to bring in different perspectives other than just the dominant approaches and paradigms in different disciplines um, and to, to bring in different voices. So this is connected to the decolonization uh, uh, discussion as well. So um, that's a good question. And I think a lot of educators are grappling with that very question themselves. 
Yeah, I, th I think Jane has raised you know a fundamental challenge to all of us. Um, and uh, and and thank you to to Jeff, and thank you both uh, both speakers, Layla and Chris, for your responses. Can I bring in um, Marisa now, Marisa Tulio, please, and you'll be followed by Paolo. Marisa. Sometimes happens, especially. Hi, when good morning. No, here we are. I'm here. Can you listen? Can you hear? Yes, yes. Okay, my question is about the um, if a car can be um, uh, uh, needs to be a hundred percent in collaboration because they say that uh, it's difficult to find um, a professor that wants to collaborate to 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 share a course. Yes, it's difficult to find. And then my question is if uh, the problem is the curriculum and uh, some contents can be the same and then um, it could be a course could be uh, given only 50 percent or less i'm not i don't know if i i was clear my english not so good <laughs> could you understand my question i think so marisa that's are you have comfortable speakers? Well, if you are, you will bring in Paolo uh, Contreras, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was really very, very interesting. Uh, my name is Paola, and I'm writing my PhD uh, analyzing the effect of internationalization of the curriculum on the development of intercultural competence. So this was really very relevant. And my question is very brief. Uh, uh, actually, were the teachers participating in the first part of the project? Uh, were did they receive any kind of training uh, on internationalization of the curriculum or was it just assumed, so to speak, that they would be able to do it because they were able to speak in English? I think Chris covered that partly, but just if that could be explained a little bit further. Thank you very much. Uh, is it okay if I go, Leila? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, thank you very much for your questions. Um, as far as um, the first one, um, what we understood uh, about COIL was that it does not have to be the same course uh, taught in two different places and 100% collaboration. In fact, the subjects can be completely different. As long as there's agreement between the educators, um, different types and different modes of collaboration can take place. What we identified was common uh, based on the few interviews that we did and our understanding of the funded programs from the government is that uh, in Japan, we have 14, 15 week semesters and often COIL programs would take place for about two to three, sometimes as long as five weeks in the middle. Um, so, the collaboration wouldn't be for the entire class, and it's often even less than 50%, um, with perhaps some lead up to it, then the interaction between the students and maybe some sort of a reflective project afterwards. Um, as far as the, oh, I have this bad habit of taking absolutely Ill illegible notes. Um, the second question, Layla, would you be willing to jump in on that to help with Paula? Um, I'm sorry, can I ask the second question as well? Yeah, should I repeat the question if, if you want me to? Yes. yes. Yeah, and uh, no, I just wanted to know whether the, the teachers participating in the first uh, project, uh, whether they uh -huh. have received any kind of training about internationalization of the curriculum, or whether it was that they were qualified because they were able to teach in English. Yes, I think uh, many of the faculty members, they, they are just asked because they can speak English and they can teach in English. That is the main, I think, the um, aspect of uh, the faculty members. Uh, but, but they need to be able to, comfortable to communicate with the partner uh, faculty members as well. So that, that will be challenge if the person cannot speak in English. And uh, but there are um, some centers or some kind of uh, institutional support uh, services established under this project uh, of COIL. 
uh, that they can find that they can somehow give ideas about coil and how to do it and, and uh, some kind of faculty development um, workshops um, they sometimes provide that they can actually get some ideas about coil and how to do it but I don't think there are um, enough uh, trainings uh, in order to have many faculty members be involved in COIL or IOC. Thanks, Leila. Thanks, Paula. And thanks, Marisa and Chris. Uh, I'm now going to bring in four questions, and I think these are probably going to be the only ones we've got time for. So let's try and get them all in at once. Chris, this is going to put your note taking under more pressure. So try to write legibly uh, so okay. you're ready for the ready for all four. Um, now, these four are going to be Carolyn, Gwina, Miwa and Aki. So let's begin with Carolyn Tiller, please. Carolyn. Are you there? Yes, sorry, sorry, I'm here. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm interested in um, you know, what evidence you've got about sort of social relativism and cultural relativism in terms of what gets included and what gets cut out from these programs, particularly if you've only got small groups focusing on what knowledge is relevant when you're working across cultures? That is a big question. Um, Gwina, Gwina Orinbeck, please. Okay, thank you so much for the interesting presentation. And then my first question, which is about um, why you are only focusing on the STEAM education rather than the social science and the humanities, because STEAM itself, it is the uh, universal itself. Then second question is that how can we understand this internationalization? Because internationalization, we understand that this is the acceptance of westernization. Uh, when you are talking about no, when the study which shows um, about the using of the Philip the classroom and the pre-record lectures can consider the internationalization. So how we can understand this internationalization of the curriculum when you're talking about this Philip the classroom and then the, when we consider this Philip the classroom and the pre-record lectures can be the internet part of the internationalization. Thank you. Chris, Lyle, did you catch all of that? Because the sound was slightly down. So if you've got your sound turned up, you will have heard that. I, I think I, I think I got the question. Okay. Yes. And then okay, let's go you. to Miwa, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. yes, thank you very much for the interesting presentation. My name is Miwa. I'm the PhD student at the University of Luxembourg. I'm Japanese, native Japanese. And uh, my question is, when you um, asked for the questions for the faculty members, RQ1, I wrote it in the chat, so maybe I don't need to repeat. Um, um, uh, did you explain how, how you define the curriculum or internationalization of curriculum? Because uh, well, I think, by the way, it's very interesting how to, um, uh, to, to find what the faculty members or professors think about internationalization of curriculum. Well, uh, looking at the, some findings, it seems that they focus on English or communication or maybe some, some sort of contents, I don't know. Um, but I thought that it could limit, actually limit the internationalization of the um, um, curriculum. So uh, that, that was my question. And I'd like to know what you think about these findings, how the teachers, professors perceive about internationalization of curriculum. Thank you very much. And just to put you under further pressure, a final question from Aki Yanazawa. Aki. Thank you, Simon, and uh, thank you uh, both. And uh, my question is written on the text, so the, please just, uh, you don't have to make a memo anyway. But uh, the first, uh, the, what your discussion was really clear. And then the basically, based on the, some instruction of the, this is the kind of the internationalization curriculum based on the Betelix, a very beautiful uh, framework, right? And then the, you will face with the, some reality of the Japanese higher education. And the first question is that uh, you already have half, uh, explained that the, there are many types of the, uh, students inside a, a Japanese university and some are simply utilizing EMI as a kind of a, uh, the very basic English language school. So some are quite, quite uh, very, uh, very good capable in English communication and they are just uh, taking class in English uh, simply because it's much more 
are efficient, just like a graduate school of the Asia Pacific uh, studies in Waseda University. So it's a very big difference. The other question, uh, and the other point is that the summer kind of the full curriculum based on uh, at the graduate school level. So they are uh, all the undergraduate school level, the, 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 all of the classes are available in English. But the, most of the cases that is the, the classes in English is just a kind of the, a collection of the several collection of the classes in a general education program. So this never been a kind of the, the systematic uh, curriculum that is uh, supposed to be uh, uh, suppose at the, the textbook of the epithelics. So the, the, my question is the first that it is possible uh, the, is that kind of connect uh, condition really, really uh, fit to the, your very beautiful framework? That is the first question. And secondly, that uh, do you think, uh, I, I feel that this is a necessity to uh, make a distinction between the institutional level discussion and the arrangement and the program or the discipline level arrangement. So that, that is my question. Thank you. Over to you, colleagues. Okay, Leila, should I try to answer all of those really quick and then you can add on uh, as, yeah. as I go? Okay, uh, thank you all for your very interesting questions. To address the first question about social relativism and cultural relativism um, and whether these ideas are being incorporated into IOC in uh, the Japanese context, I'd have to say, I, I don't think we really encountered that very much. Um, Again, many of the educators we spoke to thought of internationalization broadly and also IOC in particular as sort of just the importation of westernized approaches um, and sometimes just thought, well, our subjects are already international because of the topics. Um, there was very little consideration of the students, of the uh, cultural diversity that uh, the students brought into classrooms or Zoom rooms. And um, it seemed as though there was a lot uh, of room for improvement in those respects. Um, to move on, on to question two about why did we focus on STEM? Uh, we actually had most of our participants uh, were representing the social sciences and humanities and a, a limitation was that we didn't have enough STEM uh, programs represented, but we want to uh, expand out and get more uh, data collected from educators in STEM disciplines because there are a lot of EMI programs in STEM, especially at the national research universities. And some of those are the DEGIMA model programs that we talked about where they pretty much cater only to international students um, uh, trying to attract them to Japan because of their uh, track record in uh, the sciences. Um, as far as the question about the flipped classroom and um, pre-recorded lectures and how does that equate to internationalization? Great question. And some of the challenges that emerged um, from our discussions with, ed with educators didn't only apply to internationalization. They were more broad uh, curricular challenges uh, generally when everything moved online. And this was actually not so much a challenge, but a, uh, an opportunity to innovate. And all of these innovations we suggest might be a, a good uh, opportunity for educators in Japan to maybe rethink uh, their longstanding approaches to teaching. Um, uh, Miwa, a uh, great question about how we approached uh, the definition of IOC with our interviewees. Our protocol, interview protocol evolved um, based on the interviews and then afterwards we discuss how it went. And we ended up moving our definition from LISC later, in, later down into the uh, interview questions, trying to draw out the ideas, sort of the organic ideas from the interviewee first before saying, okay, here's uh, the main definition in the literature. What do you think about this? And um, perhaps Layla can add on um, in a moment about some of the responses we got there. Moving on to Aki. Hi, Aki, nice to see you again. Um, Aki's questions. And oh my goodness, sure enough, I've started scrolling here, but 
Um, very great points about the differences and challenges uh, faced in reality in Japanese universities, in particular, the level of uh, English language ability um, of the students. Also, um, in many cases of the instructors who are tasked with teaching EMI, um, and it really uh, brings a, a lot of different challenges, I think, at all different levels uh, and types of universities and institutions. Um, and in terms of thinking through the distinctions between the institutional level and the disciplines or faculties or, or colleges within universities, I think that's a great point. Um, and sure enough, there does seem to be these tensions between the university, the policies that are being um, uh, sort of advocated for um, increasingly changing as uh, new public management practices are, are sort of becoming more common in Japan. Um, and there arguably is a little bit more, um, uh, a bit of a threat to this uh, faculty autonomy, longstanding faculty autonomy in Japan. Um, and one thing we, we sort of discovered was that in many cases, faculty are in some ways resistant to any new ideas simply because they're perceiving it as a threat to their uh, autonomy. Um, but I think that's an important point to perhaps break apart the distinctions between institutional and also disciplinary because they might have influences on that personal level as well. Layla, anything to add on to any of that? Um, yes, um, maybe the question that um, Chiba-san asked, uh, we first asked about the assessment content and expected outcomes and pedagogy uh, and how, how they operate in the classroom. Uh, and then we uh, explain about IOC and what they think about uh, internationalization of curriculum and whether they, they actually uh, implement in their uh, courses. So it wasn't only about the communications or contents, we asked uh, all aspects, we tried to cover all aspects of the curriculum as well. And, and I don't think I have much to add, uh, but uh, thank you, Yonezao Sensei, for your question as well. I think as we need to distinguish the institutional level and program level. I think it's a big difference in terms of the faculty members' mindset as well, and also institutional support. Uh, institutional enabler probably is uh, stronger uh, where the EMI is institutionalized and uh, not just a program. So we need to try to look uh, differently maybe for the future uh, research. Thank you. I want to thank you, Lila and Chris, particularly with the way you handled those last four questions. I mean, that was terrific and, um, you know, well done and, and such a, 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 you know, valuable webinar paper today. Uh, there's a lot of interest in Japan. I mean, it's not only because of the wonderful quality of Japanese universities and the thoughtfulness and intelligence with which they go about grappling with their challenges. But, you know, also in terms of internationalization, I mean, Japan, a country with such a pronounced and reproductive singular identity, and at the same time, trying to grapple very, very firmly with the challenges of internationalization and curious about the world. And so you see these two things very heightened uh, together. And uh, in some respects that in, this, in, in a stronger, more developed form captures the dilemmas that all of us have in national education systems in dealing with a, with a worldwide environment, Chanxia as a whole, if you like, uh, and the contradictions involved in that. Um, so, you know, do come back again with your, your further developments of your research. We really welcome your participation uh, in our series. Uh, colleagues, I must apologize to Numala Simbolin, uh, Yan Wang, who had two questions, and uh, Gabriel Hervas, we just didn't have time to get to you, as you can see, uh, and do, do stay in our webinar program and ask questions next time and come in earlier in the webinar. I took everyone strictly in order today. Uh, it's really the fairest thing to do usually. Um, next uh, uh, Thursday, we have a webinar which takes us back to Europe. Um, Vasily uh, Papatseva will talk about how uh, Brexit has finally led to the a big drop off in the number of uh, EU students coming into the UK and the challenges that that creates for the UK in trying to connect to the European higher education world as well as it previously did. Um, so we look forward to, to seeing you all again in two days time. 
Thanks again to Chris and Layla and bye to everyone for now. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye.